In the end of the previous part, we have mentioned that the most technical step in our construction is to apply the implicit function theorem to solve the parameters in the Vista data. Our main results are about when is the glue construction possible? That is, in which condition can we successfully find solutions using the implicit function theorem? To describe these conditions, we find it necessary to employ the language of graph theory. So by graphs, we actually mean multigraphs. One way to define multigraph is, to, uh, is the rotation system, which is defined as a triplet consisting of the set of half, uh, half edges. And to permutations acting on the set of half edges. And here, yota is an involution with no fixed points. However, when I recently glue saddle towers into singly periodic minimal surfaces, I decided to drop this condition. I'll explain why later. Another requirement is that the group generated by yota and sigma should act transitively on the half edges. From a rotation system, it is very easy to recover a graph. The vertices are actually the orbits of sigma. The edges are orbits of the involution yota. In fact, the rotation system also determine a two-cell embedding of the graph whose faces correspond to the orbits of sigma times yota. We will use the letters V, E, and F to denote the set of vertices, edges, and faces. I mentioned that to construct singly periodic surfaces, I decided not to uh, I decided to allow yota to have fixed point. The half edges fixed by yota are then not connected to another half edge. We will see that Half edges correspond to wings, so if it is not connected to any other half edge, this wing is left open, hence correspond to a shirk end. A remark on the notation is that we write minus h for convenience uh, in, uh, in place of yota h. That is why in the node opening construction before the puncture for h, is identified to the puncture for minus h. Apart from the combinatorial data, we also want the graph to be geometrically represented depending on the text, on the context. Um, the representation could be in the flat torus if we want to construct triply paired minimal surfaces, or the representation could be in the Riemann sphere if we want to construct singly periodic minimal surfaces. In the future, if anyone wants to construct surfaces in H2 times R, he could also take graph representation in hyperbolic surfaces. In our representation, edges either have disjoint interiors or they could also be mapped to the same segment. That is because we want to include the possibility that the wings are parallel, as we will see later. In the geometric representation, the anti-clockwise order of the half edges is given by the permutation sigma. When edges are represented to the same segment, their anti-clockwise order is not perceivable in the geometric re representation but it is still combinatorially encoded by sigma. So I must admit that our treatment of graph is unconventional or even strange. So why do we insist on such a definition? That is because in our work, the graph plays two roles. On the one hand, the graph encodes the glue pattern more specifically Vertices correspond to the seven towers. 
half edges correspond to the half uh, the the wings, and the edges indicate that two wings are glued. Hence, when a wing remain open, we want it to correspond to a half edge that is not only uh, that is the only element in an edge. That is why we allowed the involution yota to have fixed point. On the other hand, we also use the graph to illustrate geometric information of the saddle tower limits. In this context, the vertices are the vertical singular lines that we want to desingularize. And we allow edges to be represented by the same segment, because in the saddle tower limits, parallel wings cannot be distinguished from a distance if you look at the surface from a distance. Before we continue, let us, let us define the notion of orientability. So intuitively, a graph is orientable if each edge can be assigned a direction so that around each vertex, the edges are incoming and outcoming, outgoing in an alternating way. And around each face, the edges are directed in the same direction. The point is that if our graph is oriented, so is the surfaces produced by our construction. Now let us recall the notions of cut space and cycle space. So a cycle is a sequence of distinct edges that form a path with no repeating vertices. Given a subset of vertices, a cut is the set of edges with exactly one end in this subset. In the real uh, valued edge space, where we define here as A, the cut space is the subspace generated by the character vectors of cuts, and the cycle space is the subspace generated by the character vectors of cycles. These two, subs, uh, these two subspaces are actually complementary to each other. On graphs, we may also define differential operators as shown here. These are actually the discrete analogs of the divergence and curl differential operators. Note that the kernel of the divergence and the image of the curl equals uh, are actually the cycle space, and the kernel and uh, of curl and the image of the divergence are actually the cut space. So why do we need these vector spaces and operators? Because we will use them to describe the period condition and the balance condition, which is necessary for the statement of our main results. So we will do it now. We define x sub h to be the edge vectors. So the norm of xh is the length of the edge and the direction is the direction of the half edge edge. Then we define the unit vector uh, u sub h in the direction of the half edges. Then the graph is well defined if the curve is zero. That means that we are back to the same point after traveling around a cycle. Well, here I say same point it is same up to parallels. We say that the graph is balanced if the divergence of the unit vectors vanish. So it can be understood that there is a unit force pulling the vertices together, and the graph is balanced under this force. In fact, it can be shown that a balanced graph is the critical point of the length functional. So, all previous construction that glue saddle towers is basically saying this theorem. So, if you have a graph that is balanced, rigid, and oriented, 
then you can desingularize the graph times r into a minimal surface with horizontal reflection plane. So here, the meaning of rigidity depends on the context. Um, it's there to allow the use of implicit function theorem. Intuitively, the rigidity could be understood as follows. So for any perturbation made to the graph, the graph should be, uh, should be capable of deforming itself to balance the effect of a perturbation. So we now give a better definition for the notion of phase. We have mentioned that this uh, notion of phase is the key notion to remove the horizontal reflection planes. Basically, the phase of a saddle tower is a value between 0 and 2 pi that indicates the height of one horizontal reflection plane of the saddle tower. Recall that a saddle tower has two reflection planes, so we need to specify which one to use to define the phase. The choice is just a matter of convention, but if one reflection plane is chosen, as we do here, and its height, say, phi, is defined as the phase, then the other reflection plane must be at um, height phi plus pi modular 2 pi. By the way, we have defined the vertical offset nu h before. It is actually, so we, we can record that it is actually the constant term in the integration of the third component, the third vice class data. But if the local coordinate is carefully chosen to be compatible with the reflection symmetry of the saddle towers, then the phase and the offset nu h is closely related as shown here in the formula. That is, they are either of the same value or their value differ by pi depending on the orientation of the half h. Now we use a function to prescribe the phase differences. So for a half h h that corresponds to a wing, uh, the value of the function phi h is the phase difference of the saddle tower glued to the wing over the saddle tower that the wing belongs. For the phase difference function to be well defined, we need that the curl vanishes mod 2 pi. That means if we travel along a cycle, the change of height should be a multiple of the vertical period. The vertical balance is however defined using a strange operator m dive. This is similar to the divergence, but the summation is only over the shortest edges in a cut. Someone must have wondered before, why do we introduce the cuts? You know, the cut space is actually generated by the vertices, so why is it not enough to just use the vertices? Well, this is the vertical, this vertical balance is the reason. The image of M dive has the same dimension as cut space, but it, it is not generated by the vertices. So why is this strange formula? That is because this term k sine is not a real force. The real force has another factor, which dominate on short edges um, as we approach the saddle tower limit. So as for the coefficient k, its definition is quite complicated. Uh, so as we see here, it's the product of the amplitude of undulations and another factor that is related to xi here, which is the first order deformation of the graph. It could be proved that the first order deformation is a solution to the equation system here. So. I suggest that you do not pay too much attention on the formula, but the most important thing is that the coefficient k 
does not depend on the change of local coordinate, of course, because otherwise our theory is not consistent. We are finally ready, ready to announce our main result. So, for the glue construction to succeed, we need the graph and the prescribed phase functions to be both balanced and rigid. Then the graph times R can again be singularized into a minimal surface. But this time, the phase differences in the degenerate limit are given by the prescribing function phi. In particular, if phi is not zero or pi on every half inch, then the resulting surfaces do not have any horizontal reflection plane. 